on. Thank you, Shira. Um, I will start. First of all, let's just go into PowerPoint. Um, eh, I, you know, I assume that uh, in the States or in North America, you're somewhat aware of this. In Israel, we are exceedingly aware of it. Uh, this has been a very tumultuous day, part of a very tumultuous month uh, in connection with everything that's going on here with the judicial reform and the different opinions about it and demonstrations and counter demonstrations. And there's a lot going on. Um, and it sort of seems a little disconnected from reality to say, oh, let's talk about the history. But, uh, but I really do feel, uh, and a friend of mine wrote this on Facebook today, you know, as much as we are struggling to define ourselves and to figure out the way forward and how to work together, we also have to look back and see what we've accomplished. And we've accomplished incredible things. Uh, and, uh, and that should give us the strength to be able to go forward and to figure out how to live together with our very vibrant disagreements. But to look back at the past is should be, in many cases, a source of pride. Uh, and I think that's part of uh, the stories that we are telling here and we're telling now. So we are in our last class of this series about uh, neighborhoods of Jerusalem. Uh, and today we're gonna talk about two places that are not very well known. Okay? These are two Jewish communities uh, from before 1948. Uh, you might look at the title, you say, Neve Yaakov. Ah, I've heard of Neve Yaakov. Some people may have even been in Neve Yaakov. I might even have some people here who live in Neve Yaakov. Um, but the Neve Yaakov of today is different than the original Neve Yaakov, Atarot as well. Uh, is not the same. And these are two communities that were created before 1948. There was, this is north of Jerusalem. We're going to look at a map in a minute. This was north of the old city. There was very little in terms of Jewish neighborhoods in the northern part of Jerusalem pre-1948. Um, it was a significant place to settle. It was important for defense. This was on the road to Ramallah, right, for farming, for expanding the city. Um, however, despite more than 20 years of success in these communities, difficulties, but also success, uh, they had to be evacuated in 1948. Uh, they were lost completely and destroyed by the Jordanians in May of 1948. Um, and only after the Six Day War was their return. Now, one of the things that's very interesting to me, uh, I think we did a class quite a while ago. We were doing a series about different parts of Israel. Uh, we did a class about Gush Etzion, and I live in Gush Etzion. I'm, I'm guessing there are probably a few people on the Zoom who also have either lived in Gush Etzion or, or know where it is. Gush Etzion, um, was very involved in maintaining the memory of the communities, right? We have a similar story. We had thriving communities, four thriving communities, not two, but four, four thriving communities cut down the War of Independence. Uh, fortunately, we don't have the same story in Natarot and Nebe Yaakov, but in Gush Etzion, you had a terrible massacre of the last community of Kfar Etzion, but the historical memory was preserved. Uh, the children of Gush Etzion, the, many of them orphans, kept close ties with each other. After the Six-Day War, they came back. Um, and we'll see that this is very different than uh, the story in Northern Gush Etzion. So uh, in, uh, excuse me, in Northern Jerusalem, these Northern neighborhoods. So this contrast of Gush Etzion and historical memory that led ultimately to return, we're gonna have a different story here, but that's jumping the gun. We'll get to that eventually. Okay, the picture, some of the pictures in the Zoom, there are a lot of great black and white photos from before 1948 uh, of both Neve Yaakov and Atarot. Um, and this is a picture of, uh, of kids in, um, in uh, Neve Yaakov practicing self-defense, right? What we would call today Krav Maga. Uh, as we're going to see, this was not a particularly safe place ever, right? It's surrounded by Arab villages. It's on the main road from Jerusalem to Ramallah. So even though there was a thriving settlement, it was not a particularly secure place. So let's, without further ado, get started. Let's understand where we are talking about. Okay, so let's go back to our map. So just to have a basic understanding, right? Here's the old city down here, right? Kota, Western Wall, right? We understand where all these things are. Mishkin uh, Ochananim, right? The first Jewish neighborhood outside the walls. 
Uh, Jaffa Road, right? All of the development of Nachlaot and all these things, uh, the, the road from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv, right? Gush Etzion, of course, south of us. Where are these communities being developed? These communities are being developed very close to uh, Kalandia, okay, in the north here. Keep on this road, right? This Route 60 that goes from Damascus Gate, right? goes from Damascus Gate. This is the road that leads to Ramallah, okay? Um, this is where these communities are founded, right? Today we have what's called the Atarot Industrial Zone uh, on what's left of Atarot. Pisgat Ze'ev, or more accurately, North Pisgat Ze'ev is where Neve Yaakov was, okay? So this is north of the city. Very little that was there, right? There really was almost nothing Jewish uh, in terms of communities that were north of the city pre-48. You had Shimon Tzadik and the area of Sheikh Jarrah. You had some communities that were very close to the old city, right? In this area, really, but not much further than that. And that's what makes these two communities really very unusual. So here we are talking about north of the city. Today, by the way, both these places, both Atarot and Pisgat Ze'ev, of course, as well as the new Neve Yaakov, we'll see that in the next uh, slide, are all within the city limits of Jerusalem. After 1967, Teddy Kolek said Atarot is within the city limits of Jerusalem, even though it's really on the outer edge, right? Pisgat Ze'ev, new Jewish community that was created post-67, right next to Beit Hanina, Arab community. We'll come back to that towards the end. But all of this area, right, is all part of the municipality of Jerusalem, okay? Jerusalem is kind of weirdly gerrymandered shape. I apologize to Canadians and others if you don't know what that word means. It's an American term for, like, creating strangely shaped congressional districts to uh, make sure you have voters who are sympathetic to you. Okay, um, moving right along. <laughs> Sorry, my, my American social studies was many, many years ago, so I'm sorry if I didn't define that exactly correctly. Okay, what are we looking at here? Okay, so you have, even if the, you're not so familiar with the Hebrew, don't worry about it, the colors are helpful enough. The red, Shkunat Neve Yaakov Hayom. This is today's community of Neve Yaakov. At the end, we'll have a really nice aerial picture that will see this even better. So this is Neve Yaakov of today. This is Pizgat Ze'ev down here, the black of today. This is the northern part of Pisgat of today, but the blue dotted line, this is where Neve Yaakov was up until 48, okay? So uh, Atarot, which is north of us, not really on this map, uh, Atarot was not rebuilt as a community, it was rebuilt as an airport and industrial zone, that's in the same place. Uh, Neve Yaakov was built in a different place, okay? And this area of North Pisgat Ze'ev, uh, on the borders of Beit Hanina, part of Neve Yaakov became part of the Arab neighborhood of Beit Hanina. This was not uh, reestablished in the same place, okay? Um, so let's, uh, let's continue. All right, I know this looks like a very, very long timeline. <laughs> Don't worry. We just want to bring out a few important uh, emphases, okay? A few important things on this timeline, okay? Uh, our story begins in 1912 when the land is bought from uh, the Arab community of, of Kalandia by Hachsharat uh, Taishuv, the Palestine Land Development Company. Okay? We have a short settlement in 1914, but then they leave. 1919, JNF buys more land, and we have the real beginning of Moshava Tarot. So the land is bought early, but it takes a few years till the actual community is created. Five years later, American Mizrahi, I know we're going to see that Atarot and Neve Yaakov have very different characters religiously. Okay, they're both very Zionist, but Atarot is very secular, and Neve Yaakov is, uh, is Mizrahi, right, is what we would call today modern Orthodox or national religious or whatever you want to call it, but religious. 1924, Mizrahi buys the land from Beit Hanina, and a, a year later, the Hebrew village, Akfar Ha'ibri Shal Neve Yaakov, is founded. Okay. Like many, many communities all over the country, 1929, terrible Arab riots, uh, communities are hit, they managed to survive, unlike, by the way, the beginning 
beginning, if we're going to compare to Gush Etzion, the beginning of settlements in Gush Etzion in the 1920s are knocked out by the riots in 1929, and they have to rebuild in the 30s, and again, riots in the 30s, and they have to rebuild in the 40s. That's not what happens in Atarot and They manage to stay, right? But they're hard hit by these riots. 1931, another blow. The British want to have an airfield, and they kind of just take some land, right, uh, from Atarot to create their airfield. But ultimately, it's helpful because this becomes the Palestine Airways, meaning the land of Israel Airways, right? This is a, becomes a Jewish airport as well as a British military airfield. Okay? Um, more Arab riots in 36. Palestine Airways begins, uh, is over basically for civilian flights. November 29th, 1947, right? Partition plan, War of Independence, and these isolated communities, right? Remember how far they are from the center, sorry, right? These isolated communities with Arabs are all around them are under attack. Um, we have an attack on a convoy like you have in isolated communities in the Galilee, like you have in Gush Etzion again, right? That convoys are attacked in an attempt to really help these two communities. There's an attack on Nebi Samuel, also in the north of Jerusalem. Terrible, terrible defeat. Um, the end of April, the women and children are evacuated from both communities. Um, May 14th, of course, the day of the state is declared. Uh, British leave, Sir Alan Cunningham, the high commissioner, leaves from the Atarot airport to Haifa. Uh, the British are gone from there. The Jews take the airport, but they have to retreat. And over the next few days, Atarot is captured, Neve Yaakov is captured. Fortunately, the survivors, many people are able to retreat to Mount Scopus and you don't have a massacre, although you do have casualties. Um, the Jordanians take over the airport. The people of Atarot found Bene Atarot, right? Uh, in a very different place, we'll see where. Um, burial in Mount Herzl of the, the casualties from, uh, from Atarot and Neve Yaakov. 67, the area is retaken. New airport, industrial zone, um, airport is then closed. And we'll talk at the end about the plans for today in, uh, in Atarot. All right, so it just gives us kind of a bigger picture, but don't worry, we're going to come back to all of these places. So we'll start with Atarot. Uh, where does the name come from? The name comes like a lot of names of, uh, of early communities. It comes from Tanakh, right? Sefer Yoshua, right? Those boring chapters that many of us like to skip over. They're, they're gold for geographers, for tour guides, for archaeologists, right? The chapters that talk about the Nachalot, right? Who, which tribe gets what? And here we have uh, the Nachala uh, of Binyamin is kind of on the border between Benjamin and Ephraim, right? You can see over here. Uh, Beit El Luza, right? The border goes from Beit El, which you can see here on the map, right? Goes from Beit El to Luz, Ba'avar El Gvul Ha'arki Atarot, and it passed onto the territories of the Arki at Atarot. Is it exactly here? Eh, nobody's found, uh, you know, dug here and found a sign. In fact, I don't think anyone's dug here at all, right? And found a sign saying, welcome to Atarot. But it's a logical place that it would be. And it was logical enough to the early settlers to take this name from, say, for Yoshua and say, oh, this is a good name for us, okay? Uh, the land is bought by, as we said, the Palestine Land Development Company, what's called Hevrat Hachsharat HaYishuv. You can see the the uh, the current building of Hachsharat HaYishuv in Tel Aviv today. Um, it's not so simple to buy this land. There are a lot of attempts uh, towards the end of the 19th, the early 20th century to settle in lands north of Jerusalem. Uh, late 19th century, there's an attempt to buy the land that Nebi Samuel is on. It's a failure. Here, they finally, after various negotiations, they managed to buy the land. That's already the first step okay, for Atarot. And then they move in some pioneers, right? Now, who are the first pioneers? The gentleman on the left might look familiar to you. That's Levi Eshkol in much later years. He was a much younger man uh, when he comes to Atarot. There's no good pictures of him as a young man, okay? Uh, the gentleman on the right, you might know his name and his picture is a little less familiar to you. His name is Yaakov Pat. If you live in Jerusalem or you travel in Jerusalem, you are familiar with Tzomet Pat, right? It's an important junction in Jerusalem. Unfortunately, so many people 
people are fated to become just street names, but we have to remember they were actually people. Um, Yaakov Pat was an important commander, first in the Hashomer, right, the first Jewish self-defense organization, then in the Haganah. Both these guys are part of the second Aliyah, okay, second Aliyah. Uh, brief period, 1904 to 1914, where you have a not particularly large influx numerically of Jews coming primarily from Eastern Europe, but they have a huge influence. These are very young, idealistic, ideological, um, motivated young people, many of them not married, and they're the guys who come with all their fiery desires for a just world. And most of them are socialists and they want to have gender equality. Well, some of them do, right? Uh, and income equality and all sorts of things. And these are the guys who create the first Jewish self-defense organization. They create the first kibbutz. They create the first kupat cholim health clinics. They do a lot, a lot of stuff that really determines the character of this country. And they also settle in a lot of places. So these are two of the people who are sent to this kind of fledgling atarot. But with World War I, lots of things fall apart in the land of Israel. World War I is a very, very huge crisis in the land of Israel, and they have to abandon the land. But they come back, not them, but different people in 1919. Now, one of the things that's very important about both of these communities, both Neve Yaakov uh, and Atarot, is that they were built not just to have settlement north of Jerusalem for defense purposes or for places to live, but is an agricultural supply point for Jerusalem, right? Jewish Jerusalem uh, had the disadvantage of their, most of the agriculture, most of the food is coming from the communities that are closer to Tel Aviv, that are in the Shvela, that are in the lowlands. The Arab communities are getting supplied by the Arab villages. And when things are peaceful, the Jews are also supplied by the Arab villages. But when things are not peaceful, right, as they were in 1948, where's your food coming from? So the idea, even before there was so much tension, was to have Jewish food chain, right, food supply, north of Jerusalem, closer to Jerusalem than places in the lowlands, in the Shvela. So uh, every resident got land, not enough land, but they got some land. They were supposed to have a farm, cows, chickens, right, as you can see here. Um, and then the produce was delivered every day to Jerusalem. Now, that's actually very significant. We're going to see later because the residents who have to get to Jerusalem, how are they getting there? They're getting there on the buses that are bringing the food to Jerusalem. That's, that's non-negotiable. Kids going to school, well, it's less important. Food coming to Jerusalem, that's very important. Um, the cows of Atarot were actually very famous. They produced more milk than the cows in Nahalal in the Jezreel Valley, which is a much, much more fertile place. Uh, this is not a particularly fertile place, but they managed to make things uh, make things grow. Um, and uh, and in fact, there's even a branch of Tsnuba, right? Tsnuba, the famous uh, milk company, but it's not only milk, it's also produce. Uh, it opens in Jerusalem because of the food supply coming from Atarot and Neve Yaakov. So this is a very essential part of the story. Um, now here's where we get to a part of the story that is uh, more exciting than the food. Um, although I would say probably not as significant, but it is exciting because here we have the very first Jewish airlines, right? That's a very big deal, right? Just like when the British allowed the Jews in the 1930s to make a port in Tel Aviv, right? Same thing with an airline. It's a sign of sovereignty. It's a very big deal. Plus airlines, you know, 1940s, it's not such a common thing. So this was a very, very big deal. The British start with an airways, right? This is not originally meant to be the Nitive Avir Eretz Israel Palestine Airways, but rather the British for their Royal Air Force, for the RAF, they want to have an airfield. They already have one um, uh, in Gaza, and uh, and they want to have one that's closer. They want to have uh, a route that will go to Haifa. They have in Lod and in Gaza, but they want one closer to Jerusalem. Uh, so what do they do? They confiscate land from Atarot, uh, and they create an airport. Now, there's not a ton of land there, and the landing strip is actually on the main Jerusalem Ramallah highway. So when planes come in, the roads had to be shut down, right? Not exactly ideal for an airport. First used only for military flights, but in 1937, opened for civilian flights. And that's when we get to this great story of the Nitive Avir Eretz Israel, founded by Pinchas Rutenberg, who was the type of person who you, you hear his biography and you say he really should have had like two or three lives. 
he was a revolutionary in not only the first Russian Revolution, but the second. He got thrown out. He was involved in all kinds of uh, underground assassinations, things like that. But he also was a brilliant engineer. And he was the guy who created the first hydroelectric power plant in the land of Israel and the Palestine Airways. So uh, so it's founded, and, and you can see, I uh, just love the things you can find on the internet, Palestine Airways Limited, ticket for flight. Who was Mr. Berger or Miss Berger or Mrs. Berger? I don't know. Uh, but they, they had a flight in, uh, what is this, February 1938 uh, on Palestine Airways. Now, this is a very short-lived airline. Um, World War II breaks out, right? Starts in 1937. World War II breaks out towards the end of 1939. That's it. No more civilian flights. So it, it doesn't last for a very long time. But we're going to see that the airport in various uh, incarnations is going to continue. But this is our, our Palestine Airways. Uh, but now coming back to our story of uh, the communities. Okay, Neve Yaakov, right? It's original name, Hakfar Ivri Neve Yaakov, the Jewish, the Hebrew village, excuse me of Neve Yaakov. Um, there are a few people who were very involved in wanting to create another community here. Um, one of them is Rabbi Yitzchak Orenstein, who we're going to see in another few minutes, who was very involved in the old city as well. Someone else was Dov Berniker. These are both uh, Orthodox Jews who wanted to create a community that would have certain, uh, certain qualities. It should be close enough to the city, about an hour's walk, they didn't get that. It should be on the main road. They got that. It should have its own water source. They didn't get that, right? All of these to create a community that will thrive on Hebrew labor, right? What we call avodayivri, not bringing in Arab workers. Um, a religious community that lives by what's called mishpat ivri, right? Jewish law. Uh, and some of the money comes from the Mizrahi movement, right? The world Mizrahi movement, uh, which was founded, of course, by Rabbi Yitzchak Yaakov Reines, who had died uh, nine years earlier, right? The land is bought in 1924. And so it's named in his memory, right? Neve Yaakov, Rabbi Yitzchak Yaakov Reines. Neve Yaakov and Atarot, very different characters, right? They are both important settlements, both agricultural, but Atarot secular, Neve Yaakov religious. Because of that, they have two different school systems, right? Very different character, ending up with the same fate, but starting out very differently. Um, Neve Yaakov, um, it was very important to them to work the land. They wanted it to be a religious community that works the land. It doesn't always work because the land doesn't always, they don't have enough water. The, the land is not so um, fertile, but they try. Um, the picture on the right is a great picture, right? The rabbis uh, and the leaders of the community all on the bus together with the produce from the farms, right? Everybody takes the bus together because there's one bus. Um, the first rabbi is someone named Rabbi Yitzchak Levi, who was a student of Rav Kook. Um, and another person who was very involved in the community was Rav Yitzchak Avigdor Orenstein, who you can see in the picture here uh, on the right. He was from uh, a family that was part of the students of the Milagon. Right? If you know a little bit about uh, modern settlement in Jerusalem, right? the first real wave of Jews coming, at least Ashkenazi Jews coming to Jerusalem in modern times, is not with the first Aliyah in 1882, but it's with the students of the Vilna Gaon, right? The Vilna Gaon, the Grap, doesn't himself move to the land of Israel, but very much teaches his students, encourages them to come to move to Israel. He sees this as a very necessary step towards bringing the Messiah. And the families that come, the Talmidei Hagra, the students of the Vilna Gaon, are among the, the, the prominent families of the old Yishuv, right? People like the Rivlin family and the Solomon family who are very involved in expanding Jerusalem and building the new city. So uh, Rav Orenstein is a descendant uh, of the Talmidei Hagra, but he himself was, you know, the Vilna Gaon was very famously anti-Chassidut. He was actually involved with uh, Chabad. He is one of the founders of Yitnive Yaakov. He lives there till 1940, at which point he left Neve Yaakov and he moved to the old city. He became one of the very important rabbis in the Jewish quarter. Uh, and in the battle for the Jewish quarter in 1948, 
Uh, he uh, and his wife both fell in the battles, and this is uh, this is his grave, which is on uh, on Harazetim, on the Mount of Olives. Right, you could see he was fifty four years old, um, and he was the rabbi of the community, but he was given a, posthumously uh, an induction into Tzahal, right, into the IDF, and he's given a serial number, uh, and it's, he has a classic soldier's grave, and it says, Nafal b'milui tafkido, he fell uh, doing, his, doing his duty, doing his job, um, and that's because everyone who fought in the old city and fell in the old city was basically considered to be a soldier. Um, the grave where he's buried uh, is on the Mount of Olives. That's the picture you can see here in the upper right. Um, the Jews who fell in the last few days uh, of the Jewish quarter before they surrendered to the Jordanians, right? You can see the date that he fell, Yudaladiyar, right? Uh, 10 days after the state was declared, a couple of days before Israel, uh, before the Jews of Jerusalem surrendered to the Jordanians. They were buried in the Jewish quarter because they were not allowed to take the bodies out of the Jewish quarter. They were buried in the Jewish quarter. The bodies stayed there from 48 until 67, at which point they were moved out of the old city because we don't want to have people buried in the old city. And they were moved to the Mount of Olives, but because it was so many years and they had been buried not clearly marked. It was a, a mass grave. They're buried in a mass grave on the Mount of Olives, but all the names are there. So that's from Orenstein, who is very much involved in Nevei Yaakov, but then just as much, if not more, identified with the Jewish quarter. Um, Nevei Yaakov and Atarot, again, similar to Gush Etzion, right? Today, you go to Pisgat Zeb or you go to Nevei Yaakov, you don't exactly feel like you're in the country. Yeah, it's nice, but you're very much in the city and buses and busy and pollution and traffic. But then these were small communities that were considered to be us oh, in the fresh air. It's so beautiful, right? People wanted to get away and be able to breathe the clean air. So you had camps, right? Summer camps, you had convalescent homes, right? And this was one of the things that they did to help make a living because the agriculture wasn't enough for them to be able to make a living. So you said, you advertised, and again, they did the same thing in Gush Etzion as, ah, oh, get away from the heat of the city, come out here, we'll have a retreat, right? That was one of the things that they did. Um, they had two different schools, as we said, one in Neve Yaakov and one in Atarot, two very different uh, you know, approaches to education. Um, but in both of them, it was basically a one-room schoolhouse. We're not talking about a lot of people, right? We're talking about 40 families. Um, in Atarot, even fewer in Neve Yaakov. Um, so you had one school for the younger kids. Uh, and when the kids had to go to, uh, to junior high and to high school, they traveled to Jerusalem because that was that was the only place you could get an educa a continuing education. Now, not a simple thing at all because uh, there's a bus. There's one bus, that bus that's taking all that produce to Jerusalem. It's leaving at 6 a.m. Uh, school starts at 7.30 or 8 o'clock. Too bad. <laughs> You get on the bus at six, you take the bus to, uh, you take the bus into school, you hang around until school starts, um, come home when the bus goes home, that one bus at the end of the day, sometimes when things were not good, right, when there was, uh, when it was not peaceful, the kids would have to stay in Jerusalem, and today, you know, you, you can laugh at it, you could say well, this was like, you know, a 20 minute drive from downtown Jerusalem, but it was not a safe road, this was the Jerusalem Ramallah Highway, uh, with a lot of Arab villages, and it wasn't always safe to travel back on it towards these communities. Um, one of the big problems of these two communities is there's no good water source. Okay? They had cisterns from the rain. Okay? They bought water from the Arabs. Eventually, they had a pipe that, that connected them to the big water source in the area, which is Ain Prat, right? Wadi Kelt. Uh, but ultimately, that line was sabotaged by the Arabs. Um, the picture on the left is an attempt to dig a well in Atarot. Uh, it was not successful. Uh, so water was a perpetual problem. They always have to worry and think about water. Uh, transportation, as we said, right? One bus a day from Neveyakov, one bus a day from Atarot. Um, if 
times were calmer and things with the Arabs were okay, they would take the Arab bus from Ramallah, but that wasn't something you could always count on. Uh, the drivers of these buses were really legendary figures because they were the they were the lifeline to the city, uh, and uh, and. They just drove their buses no matter what was happening. The bus was divided into three parts, right? The front part was the driver. The middle part was the produce, remember, the all-important produce. And the back was the passengers, right? So you had to share your bus with, you know, the fresh eggs and the milk and the fruits and vegetables. And, uh, and that was how you got to Jerusalem. Um, as we said, 29, 36 you have riots, you have Arab revolts, they're really surrounded by Arab villages. Uh, the one thing that at least Atarot had going for it was that it was very important to the British to protect the airfield. Uh, the Jews, the agriculture, they don't care so much about, but the airfield is very important to them. So they would send soldiers to protect the airfield. That's the this picture that you have here. Uh, on the left, you have an Australian soldier who's posing with the kids in Atarot. On the right, you have a Jewish guard in the Veyakov patrolling the streets. But it was definitely something that they, they had to constantly be on guard. The roads were not safe. The communities were not safe. Uh, and we're going to see if that's going to all come to a head in 1947, 1948. Um, two famous residents uh, of these communities. Uh, one doesn't uh, has a very, unfortunately, a very short life. Uh, and one was very long lived, had a lot of influence in Israel. Uh, the gentleman on the left is someone named Moshe Zilberschmidt. Uh, he worked in Neve Yaakov uh, in the 1940s. He was a young man, but uh, as a commander, and a commander in uh, in the Haganah, he was sent to be the last commander of Kfar Etzion, right? On Kfar Etzion and the Gush, again, another connection between the two. On Kfar Etzion is defending itself against the Arab attacks, and things are getting worse. March, April, May of 1948, Moshe Zilberschmidt is sent to uh, to be the commander. Uh, he doesn't survive. He doesn't survive the, the final attacks on Kfar Etzion, and he's killed there as a young man. The gentleman on the right, uh, is uh, was Judge Svital, who died not even two years ago. Um, he was a judge on the Supreme Court towards the end of his life. He's probably most famous for what's called the Tal Law, Chok Tal, which was an attempt to figure out a compromise to get the ultra-Orthodox to serve in the army. Uh, but he is a very, very interesting gentleman. He was born in 1927, so in the late 40s, he was a young man. Um, religious guy studying in the Hebrew University on Mount Scopus, which is not far from these two communities. Um, and uh, like many young students, he wanted a cheap or a free place to live. Um, and his uh, his brother and his sister-in-law lived in Neve Yaakov. They were among the families that lived in Neve Yaakov. So he lived with them uh, and he lived with them and he did guard duty in Neve Yaakov. And he writes in this book, this is autobiography, Ad Bo Hashemesh, Until the Sun Should Come. Um, and he writes about the retreat from Neve Yaakov, uh, as we're going to see in 1948, when they had to surrender and they had to retreat to Mount Scopus. And he writes about that retreat. Um, he met his wife in Neveyako, right? He's very part of uh, of the story. Uh, and then, of course, he goes on with his life and he becomes an important jurist. And he was somebody who was very um, involved in Hebrew law, right? It's called Mishpat Ivri, Jewish law, but also in Israeli law. And he really tried to bring that larger perspective uh, into the Supreme Court. So very interesting character, Tzvi Tal. Um, but now we get to our story of 1948. Okay, so end of November 1947, of course, partition plan, War of Independence breaks out the very next day. One of the most significant elements of the first part of the War of Independence, right? We can divide the War of Independence into two parts from the end of November 47 until the state is declared, right? May 14th, 1948. That first almost six months, right? And everything that happens afterwards is part two. What's the difference? Part one is local Arabs, right? The, the Arab countries around us, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, they can't declare war on Israel while the British are still here. 
So only after the British leave and the state is declared do the Arab armies around us declare war and enter the war. The first part of the war, they're being supported by the Arabs around them, but it's the local Arabs who are fighting. And the first part, those first five and a half months, a lot of the struggle is on the roads, right? Getting supplies to isolated Jewish communities or communities that are very important like Jerusalem, but the road is surrounded by Arab villages. Uh, and of course, the story of getting supplies to Jerusalem and the siege on Jerusalem and the convoys and the trucks is a very well-known, very important story. The picture here on the left is not of a convoy bringing supplies to Atarot and Neve Yaakov. No way that they would have such a large convoy. This is a, a convoy that is bringing supplies to Jerusalem. Um, to the center of Jerusalem, but these isolated areas, right, that, that's a very difficult thing, how to supply them. Um, on March 24th, 1948, is what's called Shayeret Atarot, the caravan to Atarot. These are the last two armored cars in Jerusalem, and they sent defense supplies to Atarot and Neve Yaakov from Mount Scopus, um, the one of the trucks hits a mine, uh, and then, of course, they're both stranded, attacked by Arabs. I, on the two trucks, there are 25 soldiers total, 14 of them killed, 11 of them wounded, right? So nobody escaped unscathed. Uh, all the supplies, of course, were lost to the Arabs, and this was such a terrible fiasco that the Haganah made a decision that they were not going to be sending any more convoys to these small, isolated communities. Uh, how are they going to survive? That's a very good question. Uh, but they they understood that they could not take the risk because uh, the dangers were so, so great, uh, and this convoy was so disastrous. Um, now, in the wake of that, uh, there's an attempt not to send a convoy, but to actually send soldiers to conquer the area on the way to Atarot and Neve Yaakov, and thereby to connect these communities to other Jewish communities. Uh, this is on April 22nd, Yudalid Nisan, Erev Pesach. Uh, there's an attempt to take the Arab stronghold of Nebi Samuel. Uh, you're seeing in the picture here, Nebi Samuel. Nebi Samuel is a, an extremely strategic site. It's very high up, right? Over 900 meters above sea level, looking out over Jerusalem, incredible strategic site. The Crusaders built a fortress here because it's such an important site. Um, and of course, the Arabs are controlling it. The Palmach sets out to conquer it, right? And to be able to, to help Atarot and Neve Yaakov, but they start out too late. They're discovered on the way. Um, and then it's just a terrible route. 23 Palmach fighters are killed. Uh, another 15 are killed when they're trying to take out the wounded. Um, and Nebi Samuel is lost. And we do not get it until 1948. So this was a terrible disaster. And again, an attempt to save Tarot and Neve Yaakov, which does not succeed. Um, the 1948 war, I mean, even today, but certainly in 1948, the Haganah, the Palmach, all of the, the underground movements were famous for these very young commanders, very young. So this is one of them named Chaim Poznanski. His nickname was Poza. Everyone in 1948. Had a, had a nickname. He wasn't even 20 years old. Uh, and he was a commander. I mean, look at him. He looks like he's a child. But he was an incredibly charismatic commander. Uh, and soldiers who had served under him and who survived, right, and who went on to become generals in the IDF and like veterans and very important, they looked back at this guy, right, this 20-year-old guy as their inspiration. So he was really considered to be a legendary commander, even though, unfortunately, he was killed so young and uh, so early. Um, and that was basically the end of Atarot and Neve Yaakov. Okay? The end of April, the women and children are evacuated. The British press on the two communities to evacuate. The Arabs, of course, even the Haganah, wants the Jews to leave Atarot and Neve Yaakov. Okay? They're very worried about a massacre. Um, the Jews don't want to leave. May 14th, the British leave the airport, right? They're leaving the land of Israel. The Atarot fighters take the airport, but the Haganah says, retreat to Neve Yaakov. What happened? Why May 14th? What's, why did they suddenly say, don't hold on to something that you gained? It's the day before, right? May 13th, 
Dalit Iyar, the fourth of Iyar, that's the day that the Jordanians conquer Kfar Etzion and take the 120 fighters who are left there and just massacre them. And the Haganah is very concerned that's what's going to happen here. So they say to the fighters in Atarot, abandon Atarot, go and join the fighters in Nebeyakov, right? And you can see this is the green, right? Here's Atarot, right? So they have to go from Atarot and they go and they join the fighters in Neve Yaakov. Um, on May 15th, the very next day, Atarot is captured and destroyed by the Jordanians. They even destroy, they desecrate the cemetery that's there. Um, on May 16th, there's a final battle in Neve Yaakov. Okay? Five soldiers are killed and are buried there. And then they retreat in the night. This is what Svital describes. In the night, they retreat to Mount Scopus. Okay. Um, so they lose the two communities, but many of the fighters survive. Um, but that's it, right? The, the communities are finished. Um, now, what happens next is that this area, of course, becomes part of Jordan. Uh, the Jordanians use the airport. Right. The airport is very useful. So they expand the airport. They use the land of Atarot, no longer a community there. They also use the land of the cemetery. The cemetery is completely desecrated. And this becomes a very busy international airport, right? In 1966, there are 100,000 travelers who travel through this airport. I, obviously, this airport is off limits to Jews. Right? This is in Jordan. Can't go here. But you can see, it's very busy. Air Jordan traveling in and out of the Atarot Airport. Right? So you had an airport that brought people to Jerusalem. Very significant. Um, meanwhile, what's happening on the Jewish side? Um, the gentleman on the left is, of course, Rav Shlomo Gorin, right? the first chief rabbi of the IDF, someone who was responsible really for establishing uh, halakha in the IDF. He was really a halakhic genius, uh, and he was called upon to arbitrate many questions that determine the religious character of the IDF till today. But one of the most significant, uh, important stories uh, in the very beginning of the state was reclaiming bodies of soldiers that were over enemy lines. Okay? Why is it such a big deal? First of all, it's a very strong Jewish value in proper burial, right? We want to be able to bring the bodies to a proper burial, to be able to identify them. And also, you have a very serious halachic problem of agunot. If you don't know that somebody is actually dead, if you can't identify a body, the widow remains chained. She, she can't remarry. So Rav Goran was very important to him to be able to bring back the bodies from over enemy lines. He had all kinds of complicated negotiations. The Egyptians were more accommodating, the Jordanians were less accommodating, but ultimately, they allowed him to visit with his staff, obviously, to go back to battlefields, right? In October 1949, Ragoran visits 152 sites that are over enemy lines, right? He, he, uh, he has to have maps. He has to have testimony from fighters. He moves people who are buried in regular graves. Right. So, for example, Kfar Etzion, right, where Jews had been buried, but now it was over enemy lines. But he also collects body parts. He brings back as many people uh, as possible. 228 coffins with 323 fallen. They're brought through the Mandelbaum Gate. And then on the 17th of November, 1949, you have this extraordinary vision, right? You have this huge funeral. Um, where are they brought to? They're brought to the new cemetery on Mount Herzl. Right? Mount Herzl just created after the state. Um, and they take this, the bodies in this huge caravan okay, from the center of Jerusalem, from the Yeshurun Synagogue on King George Street, uh, and they bring them through the streets to Mount Herzl. 50,000 people are lining the streets watching this happening. It's a national day of mourning. They're brought to Mount Herzl and they're buried. The ones who you can identify the bodies are buried in individual graves. The ones that you can are buried in mass graves, right? So you have, and this is a part of Har Herzl till today, Mount Herzl, you can go to see the graves um, from Gush Etzion, uh, and from Har Adar, and five graves from the Yaakov, right? The five fallen from the Yaakov, that's the picture over here. Um, Igal Yadin, 
who was the chief of staff, he spoke at this funeral, and he says, Yerushalayim giborim saviv la Jerusalem, right, he's taking the, the verse from Tehillim, Jerusalem is surrounded by hills, Jerusalem is surrounded by warriors, right, the people of Gush Etzion and Latrun and Haradar and Nebei Yaakov, they're the reason that a free Jerusalem exists, because they protected the approaches to Jerusalem from all different directions, right, so that's the story of bringing back the bodies, Meanwhile, what happens to the people? So the survivors from Atarot rebuild, but nowhere near Atarot. They create a new Atarot uh, in a place that they call Bene Atarot, right? Where is this? It's very close to the airport, right? Here's the airport. Here's Beirot Yitzchak. Okay? They don't create something out of nothing. What was on this site before they come here to create Bene Atarot? This was the site of a place called Wilhelma. Right? Now we have a group of um, German Christians who are called the Templars who come to the land of Israel in the 19th century, right? Many of us, I'm sure, are familiar with the German colony in Jerusalem. It's also a German colony in Haifa. There's Sarona in Tel Aviv. Right? These German Templars, these are uh, a sect of Protestants from Germany that believe that the redemption is coming. Uh, and they are very industrious and they come and they build communities and they're farmers, but they also are involved in building and they do all kinds of good things, uh, except what happens is that in the 30s with the rise of Nazism, a lot of them become Nazi sympathizers uh, and the British don't want them here. <laughs> Uh, and the British kick them out, right? The British kick them out, uh, and uh, ultimately their property becomes what's called Ruchush Natush, abandoned property, uh, and it's given over to the Jews. Now, very interesting, by the way, in, um, in the reparations agreement that Israel does with Germany, right? The very controversial reparations agreement in the 1950s, a small portion of the money that Germany gives to Israel, Israel gives back, to pay for these properties, right? Because they were German-owned properties. Um, but uh, Wilhelma was one of the communities of the Templars. They sold their produce. So that's the picture on the right here, right? The pro produce from Sarona and from Wilhelma. They sold their nice Jaffa oranges. Okay? Uh, and the people of Atarot move in, take over the buildings, repurpose them. They put up some memorials uh, in the village, right? This is a memorial to the fighters who fell in Atarot. But post-67, unlike in Kfar Etzion, they don't push to go back. They, they've established this community, they established it already early on, uh, and they don't push to go back to their original site. Uh, and it's a very interesting question why. I, I don't know if I have a great answer. Um, perhaps they really were able to establish themselves here and they didn't feel the need to go back. Perhaps the you know they, they didn't want to be in an area that was more controversial. I don't have a great answer. Um, 1967, we cut, and the Yaakov doesn't get rebuilt somewhere else. Um, and we'll see, it will get rebuilt after the Six Day War, but it doesn't get rebuilt after 1948. 1967, this all comes back to Israel. Israel takes back the area of the airport. They reopen the airport. And Teddy Kalak, like we said, puts it all within in the city limits of Jerusalem. In the beginning, the airport is just uh, for internal flights like Arkea. Um, there are oppos there's opposition to international flights because remember this is territory that was taken in the Six Day War. Ah, this, should we you know accept this as part of Israel? Menachem Begin lands uh, in this airport when he comes back from Egypt. So it, there is a, a feeling that we want to you know have some uh, you know make this a real international airport again. Um, but it, it doesn't. It, by the time we get to the Second Intifada in the 2000s, this airport is not being used anymore. But it does have a short heyday where it really is used again by Israel. Meanwhile, what happens in the territory of these places of Neve Yaakov and Atarot? So Atarot, mostly the airport, we'll see something else in a minute. The area of Neve Yaakov is where uh, there is a, a new community called Pisgat Zev that's built in the 1980s. Right? Uh, the area of Pisgat Zev in the north, as we saw before, that's really the place of the original Neve Yaakov. Today, after much effort by um, some of the descendants or actually one of the original, one of the children of Neve Yaakov, there's actually a little park 
uh, a memorial on the site of where part of the original Neve Yaakov was and their sign. So here you can see Yamivaker, visitor, your feet are standing on the lands of the Hebrew village of Neve Yaakov. If you look north, you can see the where the uh, the airport was. That's where the Moshav of Atarot was. The two Atarot and Neve Yaakov fell into the hands of the, uh, the Jordanian Legion in 1948 and were liberated by the IDF in the Six Day War. Okay, so today there is something of a memorial, but Neve Yaakov was not rebuilt there. Um, Pisgat Ze'ev is an interesting community. It's right next door. We saw on the map in the beginning, it's right next door to the Arab neighborhood of Beit Hanina. In Beit Hanina, on the top of a hill, is this very interesting structure. Okay, this is called Tel El Ful. Uh, if you go up to it, it's, it's an abandoned building that's becoming more broken down every year. But if you venture up there, you are rewarded by an unbelievable view of the whole area, okay? Um, what's this place? Its Hebrew name is Givat Shaul. This is the place where King Saul builds his palace when he's the first king of Israel. We're in the territory of Benjamin, um, and he builds his palace up here on top. And there's been some archaeological excavations. We found stuff that goes back to the 11th century before the common era to the time of King Saul, but that's not what this skeleton building is. This is from the 1960s. King Hussein of Jordan saw what an important site this was strategically and just in terms of beauty, and he starts to build himself a palace up here. But with the Six Day War, obviously, he is not able to live here anymore, but the, the building skeleton still exists, right? It's still there. It's not been taken down by Israel. The uh, question is, does it's the private property of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan? Can you take it down? Meanwhile, nothing's built there. It's an interesting story, but it's a very interesting site. So that's on the edge of Pisgat Zeev. Nothing to do with our story, but I couldn't ignore. Right. So um, today, the site of Atarot, the airport is no longer functioning, but there's a big industrial zone. Uh, and uh, Israel Aircraft Industries is also one of their branches is there. And there are, uh, it's basically closed off to the public. You can't really go into most of it, but there are memorials there on the site of the old cemetery, right? So you can see Pony Kabar, right? You have the list of all the people who were buried here, right? Not all of them from 1948. You have people who were buried here in the 30s, right? Um, but the cemetery was desecrated uh, and they put this memorial here and they put another memorial to the Shomrei HaMakom, right? The ones who stayed behind, who tried to protect the site, who tried to keep it uh, for the Jewish state, um, but you, you don't have more than that. So it wasn't rebuilt. Uh, and today there are uh, both historians as well as people from the original community who are kind of working to have more historical memory of the site. It's an uphill battle because it's not really a super accessible site, but, uh, but the story is being told more and more. Um, now, what about modern history? So from the 1970s, there's a new Neve Yaakov, okay? So if you look in the picture here, um, in the aerial photograph here, um, okay, the area here on the left, this is the nor North Pisgat Ave of today. That's the original Neve Yaakov. All this stuff is the new Neve Yaakov. So it's not far from it, but it's not in the exact same place. Um, in the 1990s, you had a very large influx of ultra-Orthodox uh, into the area because it was affordable, right? Um, there are also a lot of Russians, Ethiopians. Today, the neighborhood of Neve Yaakov has about 25,000 people, of which 50% are under the age of 21. That gives you a little bit of idea, demographics, right? Haredi families, lots and lots of kids. Um, so that's just kind of, uh, kind of neat to know about. Meanwhile, what happened in Atarot, uh, hold on, finish, get rid of you. Okay. What happened in Atarot is that it became this industrial zone. Okay. The airport uh, was shut down during the Second Intifada, 
Uh, the industrial zone was also shut down, but it's been reopened. Today, there are more than 160 factories there. Right? A lot of Arab workers. It's the largest industrial park in Jerusalem. So it really is a very important place. It's not a particularly beautiful place, but it's a very important place. There's a shopping center, but there's a lot of factories there. But then the question is, what's going to happen next? All right, there's a there's a high housing crisis in much of the country, certainly in Jerusalem, uh, and this is an architect's plan for a tarot, which is to build uh, a very large ultra orthodox neighborhood, nine thousand housing units, all industrial zone, uh, commercial zone, uh, naming it uh, a tarot Yosef. So you keep the old name, but it's also named for Rabbi Badi Yosef, right? chief rabbi uh, a few years ago. Um, so it was meant to be an ultra-Orthodox neighborhood. There was a big uproar because here we are in the center of this very, you know, it's right next to Ramallah, a very Palestinian area. How are you creating this huge Jewish enclave, right? Should it be for Palestinians? Should the airport be reopened? The people of Atarot, the Bnei Atarot didn't like that they were changing the name. Everybody got mad about something else. <laughs> Um, meanwhile, the plans have been frozen, and uh, who knows? Who knows what will be? But this is a very large area which is underutilized and which really could be used. It's not going to be used as an airport anymore because Ramallah is uh, under the auspices of the Palestinian Authority, and it's literally a stone's throw away, so it's not a great idea for an airport, but it certainly could be for a uh, uh, residential community. So stay tuned to what will happen next. But meanwhile, let's see, not so many comments today. Everybody's very quiet today. What's going on? All right, so let's see. Hold on, uh, all the way back. Uh, I worked in a factory in Atarot. Much of the workforce came from Nebeyakov. Many Russians, no Arabs, right? And that's not true today. Um, on the van from Jerusalem, we passed, right? So we saw. That, we saw uh, one, one comment about that, you mentioned that they grew a lot of produce there and yeah. uh, that it was a, a, an area that provided produce to, to Jer Jerusalem. In that factory, as was the custom and is probably now the custom everybody ate lunch in the company dining room they okay. cooked lunch, and the fruits and vegetables were extraordinary wonderful <laughs> and the rumor was that they were fertilized with sewage and that's why they were so good oh nice <laughs> and they You're were still hard to the tell arabs. the tale though they were bought from the the arabs who lived in that area <laughs> Okay. I said you're still here to tell the tale, so it couldn't you have bet. been too bad. You bet. All right. Elbridge Jerry designed the system of gerrymandering. Thank you. I told you I forgot my social studies. Um, how many casualties in 1948? Not so many, but only because it wasn't a very large community. And you had the five from Neve Yaakov at the end. Um, from Atarot, I don't remember the numbers, but it was, I believe, below 20. Uh, but you also had the casualties on the way, right? The kind of on the uh, the casualties from the convoys, the casualties from Nebi Samuel, right? So you had uh, you had battles that were connected, even not from the final battles. Um, Tam was supposed to be the landing strip, and that's where its name comes from. Um, but it, it didn't happen. I think it was an airfield actually that the British used like as a temporary landing strip, but it didn't stay. Um, Neve Yaakov is the site of Amuna's children's village. Thank you. Um, the water problem is still there, but on the other hand, we don't rely today on you know, on a, on a spring. We have water carriers that bring you water. You know, Jerusalem's water comes mostly, not from Jerusalem, right? It's coming from near Rosh Ha'ayin. Uh, you have water, uh, you have national water carrier that's bringing water to all sorts of places. So I agree with you. It is partly a problem, but not as much as it would have been in the 40s. Um, we flew out of Atarot to a lot. Wait, I missed this in 1969 to escape the snow in Jerusalem. Very cool. Anybody else here fly out of Atarot or fly yeah. into Atarot? Yes, in 1968. Yeah, tell us, tell us the story. We flew on our Kia to go to Eilat. Very cool, very what? cool. Yeah, I, it was before my time. I did not do it, but uh, but it sounds like a very neat thing. But yeah, I don't we, think we did it also, but I it was later. I don't remember what you <clears throat> uh, I think my husband 
Yeah, who's speaking? Dr. Katz, go ahead. You're muted, unmute. You're still muted. Can I unmute her? Hello? Now tell us. Yes, now we okay. Um, when we went in, this, in the early 70s, Atarot was also a private plane. You could land a private plane in that, in the, that airport. And my husband was a pilot. Uh, um, and uh, we were looking into that as a possibility. So it, it was not just a, for Arkea. It was also for uh, private planes. That's very cool. Did you do it? Uh, no, we uh, uh, we never uh, followed up with it, but uh, it was okay. uh, definitely in use at the time. Very cool. Thank you. Um, All right. Anybody Sydney, else? Sydney, is that the yes. area? Is that the area where there was a recent attack on a shoe in uh, near Bethany? Yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. yes, that's true. That was that terrible attack about about a month and a half ago. Yeah, I, I really should have added that in. That's true. Uh, when I prepared this PowerPoint, it was before that happened. But yes, thank you for reminding us of that. Okay, everybody, thank you for joining and listening. Um, and have a wonderful Pesach, and we will meet again. God willing. Thank you. 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 Thank you.